Ouais. We're live, folks. No heads up. That's how we do it sometimes on Let's Run.com. But hope we'll get the viewers trickling in. And if you're listening to this on demand, thank you. This is the Friday 15. This is for you, the Let's Run.com supporters club members. We love you. Robert has a special message before I do the intro. Thank you, John. For a lot of people sign up with Black Friday special. We want to welcome them from all over the world. Tokyo, Japan. Just sent out a t-shirt. I know there's a lot because it's, I don't think I announced it on the regular show. We need to have a formal announcement next Tuesday. I do officially have a broken elbow after falling off my ladder. Stuffing the shirts to send out across the globe. Nothing stops me to support the supporters club members from getting their shirts. So thank you for signing up. We hope you enjoy your bonus podcast today. Oh, man. This is really going to dampen the efforts to run that sub three marathon in 2023 we might have to wait until 2024 for that one rojo but by the way uh, on tuesday i'm going to wait till tuesday show to read it but a very very prominent member of the running community i didn't even know they listened to the podcast they said wow we didn't hear i didn't hear anything about your arm on the podcast i guess it's not broken i was like wow you're more thoughtful than jonathan or my brother even my own parents so we have very powerful important people listening to this so we need to be on our, on our game, folks. I'll, I'll show you the text message on Tuesday. All right. Okay. Sure, tell well, the people, what are we going to talk about today, John? Well, I'll tell them in a second. I just want to point out, Weldon did ask you about your sling last week, and you didn't really give him an answer on Tuesday. So Weldon was being, I'm going to give him credit as being a considerate brother there. All right. Talking about today, busy weekend of track and field. Well, some of it's road running. So some of it's cross country. We've got a little bit of everything. NXN is tomorrow, Saturday morning in Portland, Oregon. Later in the day, we have the Boston University season opener, 3Ks, 5Ks, even a couple fast people in the miles as well. And then the big one, Sunday, Valencia Marathon. Should be one of the races of the year. 5K, 10K world record holder, Joshua Cheptegei making his marathon debut and he may not even finish on the podium this race is stacked it always is we've got 10 guys with sub 205 personal best on the women's side a pair of former world record holders alma zayana Kenzebe de baba are the headliners as well as the first marathon in nearly four years for work nesh de Geffa, former boston champion formerly one of the fastest in the world she's back after having two kids and we're also going to talk about the World Marathon Majors. They've said they might be expanding to Sydney as soon as 2025, adding a seventh race. I'm sure Rojo has some thoughts on that as well. This is Jonathan Galt, joined by Robert and Weldon Johnson, the co-founders of Let's Run.com. I'm excited. This is great. I'm in Boston. We'll be boots on the ground for the BU 5K tomorrow. See how fast some of those college kids can go. It, it should be a Weekend of fast times, the first weekend of December. It's great, John, that we now have Valencia essentially as, well, you talked about them adding a world marathon major. But we don't need the Sydney Marathon as a world marathon major. I don't, if you know the world marathon majors, I don't know why you delete, delete your product. But in the realm of Let's Run.com, Valencia is a world marathon majors. I think the fields are that good. And it's obviously a very interesting race when you have Joshua Cheptegei, the world record holder at 5,000 and 10,000 meters, making his debut. And I don't Look, know, kudos to Valencia for getting him. But <laughs> of the Ugandans who could possibly make a marathon debut right now, the crazy thing is he would be my number two choice. I agree with you. I think Jacob Kaplimo is going to be the better marathon project prospect from Uganda. I, I didn't really know what to make about this. It's been a little bit strange. I mean, first of all, this is historic. And I said, Jonathan Galt, I need you to do this. Find this out for me. When, I mean, first of all, it's not that common just for the 5,000 and 10,000 world record holders to even make a marathon debut. A lot of times, I mean, back in the day, the people running the marathons weren't the people setting the five and ten thousand world record off sometimes. But I said, so just just to have just for the marathon world record holder, I mean, the five and ten world record holder to be running a marathon is unusual. But I said, when is the last time, John, 
that someone was actually still at their peak on the track as a 5,000, 10,000 world record holder made a marathon debut, right? Like when Bekele went to the marathon, when, when Gabriel Solasi went to the marathon, he'd already been surpassed by Bekele on the, on, on the track. When Bekele went to the marathon. That's not quite true. Bekele didn't really become the king of the 10K until 20, 2003. Geb made his debut in 2002. To be fair to Geb, I mean, he wasn't peak Geb, but he's still pretty darn good. He still got a silver medal on the track the next year in the 10K. He still ran 26, 29. So he wasn't done, but he was not at the peak of his powers, Robert. Okay. But when Bikili went to the marathon, he'd clearly been surpassed by Mo Farah. But in this case, we have Chepta guy. Not only does he have the world records, he said that he won the 10,000 this year at Worlds. And, you know, in, in your preview article for Valencia, you did a great job of, of pulling up the stats. And you've got to go all the way back to basically 1976, right? To, to find a time when, you know, the... 5,000 and 10,000 world record holder made a marathon debut while they were on top of the game in the track. Lassie Viren, he won the, what, the five and the 10, John, at, at, at the, those Olympics and then was fifth in the marathon. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Little asterisk. He was no longer the five and 10K world record holder at that point, but it's pretty rare for someone to even hold both of these records simultaneously. It was Geb and Sorry, it was Bekele and Geb before Chepta guy. They both made their marathon debuts. But then, yeah, you'd have to go back to Viren for someone who held both of those records. And didn't have them at the time. So maybe we've got to go all the way back to the 1950s for Zadabek. Yeah, because, I mean, Ron Clark did hold both records, but he'd already run a marathon beforehand. And then once you get before, before Zadabek, you're talking about the marathon was really not run very often except at the Olympics. So that's why you see people like Viren and Zadopek debuting at the Olympics because, you know, marathoning, professional marathoning as we know it, didn't really exist back then. So and he, this John, is historic. Yeah, uh, that's what we're basically trying to say. We talked about Gabriel Sosa in 2002. He'd already lost the 10,000 in 2001. He was only third in that race. So right, anyways, right. it's a historic race. What can we expect? The thing that's been a little bit unusual to me is I feel like his camp is purposely, and even and, and Chapter Guy himself has been saying, like, I'm just looking to run a good race. I want to be on the podium. I'm getting my feet wet. And then the, the plan is to get some experience in the marathon here, go back to the track for the Olympics. And then they, they said after the Olympics, he, he's he's done with the track. But I'm like, wow, they're kind of, I wonder if it seemed to me that they were consciously lowering expectations. But then this morning when I woke up, I sort of see fuel thrown on the fire from Elliot Kipchoge saying basically he expects Joshua Cheptegei to break the world record. He, he didn't say it in this race, but the way it was written, it almost implied that, which I don't think was a very good job, but I got to find some of these quotes, but John, did you, did you see this article this morning and were you stunned by it? I read the article. Yeah. Jos Herman's actually, I was talking to, he's the head of the NN running team, which Cheptegei runs for. And he, which Kipchoge also runs for. They're kind of teammates in a way. And he messaged me this article, and I looked at it. And I was like, "Okay, it's kind of interesting, but it's also that's just one man, one man's opinion. Like, it's not crazy to suggest a guy who holds the world record in the five thousand and the ten thousand could one day break the marathon world record. You know, the, pro, the sport does continue to make progress, and if Chepta guy's the guy of his generation, maybe it happens, but." I, I don't know. I think I'm trying to think, do I ever think he would break the world record? He's a guy who maybe could do it, but like you guys, I think Kip Limo has a better chance of doing it one day. And also with the way Kiptum, Kelvin Kiptum, who's full well, officially like four years younger or three years younger than Chip to guy, but maybe they're around the same age. Who, you know, who knows? Kiptum's maybe not done lowering the world record. So I think it's going to be very tough to break. But yeah, I, I looked at that. It kind of surprised me. But at the same time, yeah. I'm like, all right, just because Kipchoge thinks it's going to happen doesn't mean it necessarily is going to happen. And certainly, Cheptegei and his coach, Adi Reuter, when they've spoken to the media, have kind of lowered expectations, and for good reason. He had a foot injury, if you recall. That's why he did not run the 5,000 at Worlds. It's why he skipped the Diamond League final. 
which meant I think he only had a build up of about eight weeks is what I read uh, in one of the articles ahead of Valencia. So obviously that's not quite ideal. And he doesn't run very many miles. I mean, part of that is just because it's really the terrain in Uganda where he trains. It's very hilly and rugged. Like that's why he's such a great cross country runner. But I think the most mileage he was running in a week for this training was 99 miles in a week. And his long runs, he was saying, you know, he he wasn't doing much beyond 25 kilometers before he started doing the marathon, which makes, I guess, makes some sense. But I don't know. I don't see him as someone who's going to step in right away and totally take over the marathon. But in a couple of years, when he's fully dedicated for it, you know, who, who knows what his potential is? Obviously, you don't run 2611 without having a pretty big engine. So the actual quote from this article that I said that I saw this morning from the BBC, Joshua chipped a guy, Ellie Kipchoge backs Uganda for greatness before marathon debut is he's already a record holder in other fields and he has a huge chance to break a world record in the marathon said Kipchoge to BBC sport Africa. Now I wasn't sure to me, there's often these articles in, in, in the Kenyan press and it's some of the quotes are almost like, Maybe they actually said them, but it's like it reminds me of like sports writing in the 1930s in America, kind of like they're almost like symbolic. You can't really take them totally literally. Like, my, 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 I'm excited about this race, but my expectations are not that high. Now, you, you talked about the mileage as being one reason that to me did not really um, bother me i mean you had these details in your article you said that he was you know it's also from the race results weekly article from david monte that he ran between 87 and 99 miles due to muddy tra muddy training conditions in his kenya so that's a lot less than what kipchoge runs 30 to 40 miles a week but you know addy Ruder told you john this is 12 to 15 more miles a week 20 to 25 kilometers a week more than what he does for the track and to me i thought okay that's appropriate. That's what you want to do. You don't want to take too big of a jump in your training. And I, I always used to say, I, I gave, I, I've given this speech at, at tons of high school cross country camps. And I used to do it. My whole training philosophy based in Cornell was you don't go from, you know, point one to point 10. You go with one to two to three to four, A, B, point C, one, D. Point 10 actually is the same number, Robert. I don't know if, you don't go from one to 10, John, yeah, I, so I misspoke. Yeah. but you know, go, you go from 30 miles a week to 40 miles a week to 50 miles a week. And I'm like, you want to add 10 to 15 miles a, a year. Anything more than that is more than what your body can handle in the short term. So he's running more, which is good. Um, but the thing that concerns me is just more that he hasn't shown great proclivity at the half marathon. I mean, Kibiat Candier, by the way, who's in this race and is in Supreme Four, Supreme Shape, you know, has a 57.32 half marathon uh, world record. Chepta guy's only run, what, two half marathons in, in his life. And he's been beaten convincingly in both of them. He was fourth at the 2020 world half in 59.21. So he's 32 seconds back of Caplimo, his fellow Ugandan. And then this year at the world half, he ran... 6131 and again was destroyed by Coplimo by 38 seconds. So I, I'm expecting a, a night a, a good run from Chapter Guy in this race, but I think people are going to view it as disappointing because this could be more like a, a can I say Bikile type debut. Like what did he run in Paris? Two or five or four. You know, two or five or four, add in the super shoes. So you could still see it, even a two or three, but you could still end up losing this race significantly because of, of the quality of the field. And Weldon talked about the marathon majors, but this field is insane. There's 10 guys in it that have broken 205 in it, 16 that have broken 206. Let's look at the other marathon majors. I mean, other marathon majors. This technically isn't a major because it's better than the majors. The most that any other major had, London had eight sub 205s. Tokyo had nine sub 205s. So th this has got the most sub 205 guys in it. And that doesn't even count Chapter Guy. So I, I think he's got a, a really stiff competition here. I'm not expecting a win. We'll make our predictions at the end of the show. 
Yeah, can we stop the nonsense of the world record? You guys found some crazy quote from Kip Choge. Meanwhile, Joshua Chupt guy said, I'm not going for the world record. I hope to just get on the podium. And do you guys remember what the world record is now in the marathon? Yes, yeah, two, two hours 35. Yeah, I still don't remember how to say it properly, but yeah. yeah. The 235 thing that nobody knows how to say. Two I mean, hours, 35 seconds. That, from the get-go, yes. So any, I guess thank you, Eli Kipchoge, for... He's finally acknowledged the world record. He's finally acknowledged he doesn't have the world record, right? People are pointing out in Let's Run that, oh, Kipchoge needs to thank Kelvin Kipton for breaking the world record. Well, apparently now, Eli Kipchoge knows what the world record is. So thank you for that. But no, there's no world record. And the, it's crazy. Graham Blanks runs almost as much as Chepta guy does, right? I mean, or more, maybe. More. More. He does they it one few a day. Well, I, I don't yeah. know if Chip the guy's taking a day off. They oh, the train's too tough. I mean, he you uh, can't argue with with the success he's had, but it's sort of nuts. But I don't think a guy who's been beaten convincingly in two half marathons, only run two half marathons, is going to shock the world in his marathon debut. Now, he is one of the greatest distance runners of all time, so there is the possibility of proving us wrong. But I think somehow, you know, like. The K-Lace debut was a little muted, the 205 at the time. So uh, if he runs 203, I think that's a very good debut. I could easily see him dropping out, not being on the podium in this race, not even being top five. That's how deep this thing is. Um, but, it, yeah, I mean, the guy who – I guess who do you guys think is going to be – I mean, there's other guys who have more marathon experience, but there's another guy with half marathon experience, Kibowat Kandoe. I believe he's run one marathon in New York – finished way back 213 or something he's back at it again but i mean that this guy just tears up valencia every single time he's run he's run 57 40 i think in the half there won the half three times like he's back in the marathon for a second marathon he hasn't run since new york in 2021 if i have to pick a guy to do better i'm picking him because he just blitzed yeah, 57 you, 40 he, he beat a bunch of track studs he this smoked year. the world half marathon champion uh, Sebastian Sawe, and he did that in October. So he was healthy in October. Joshua Chepta guy is still working his way back from injury. So yeah, I feel like if you're giving me Candier or Chepta guy on Sunday head to head, I'm probably taking Candier. Doesn't mean he'll win. Alexander Mutiso, who ran 203 here last year, is also running. Gabriel Guille, who ran 203 flat, finished second in this race to Kiptum last year, and then finished second in Boston in April. He's running as well. It's there's some tremendous, tremendous athletes in here. So it even getting on the podium, like if Joshua Chetagai runs 203 for third, I think that's a pretty good race for him. Especially when he's saying, you know, my focus next year is still on the Olympics. After the Olympics, I'm gonna be a marathoner. But for next year, 10,000 in in uh Paris is his aim. The one question I would ask you guys, does Sifan Hassan's success this year? Running London, sorry, winning London, winning Chicago only a few weeks after meddling at the World Championships, not totally training for the marathon and having success. And also we've seen last year, Letissa Megide shows up to Valencia, runs 216, debut record. She does get beat in that race. Helen O'Beary, track silver in 2022, spring of 2023, she wins the Boston Marathon. She's now won New York. She's transitioned fairly smoothly apart from that debut. Like, to me, it just looks like people are transitioning quicker. They're not, like, they're not these mega talents on needing a year or two to figure out the marathon. They're kind of getting into it right away. Does that, particularly looking at Hassan, change your opinion or factor into your thinking for Cheptegei at all on Sunday? Or is Hassan just such a freak outlier. We don't take her into account. It changes it a little bit for me, but when I think of Hassan, I think of freak. I still can't get over that she won London somehow in two eighteen thirty. Like I know it was a bad day. It was cold. Well, it wasn't a bad day because Kipton ran two two oh one, right? No, it was. It was. Those, it wasn't great. It was like well, cold and well, drizzly. Guess, yeah. yeah, but it's because Kipton it wasn't was a freak too. It wasn't a great day to run fast. But the field was absolutely loaded. Everybody was slowing down. She got dropped and somehow she won it. But I think what you're seeing with the super shoes is 
people and, and the training is better nowadays. Most people are high mileage. It's professional setup. Like they're just the, the, the fear of hitting the wall is gone. Sort of like the shoes help you a little bit and you know, it's, it's, it's easier on that front, but I, I don't. Hassan ran 218. She just ran 213. So her first marathon, she was five minutes off what she was capable of. And I don't know, like even in this day and age, like it may, it may not be politically correct to say, I think that the men's running is still more is, is significantly deeper than women's running. So I, I think that that's where he could get in some trouble here is there's so many good guys. Hey, on let's run, we can say what's not politically correct. It's that's just a factual statement. Men's running is, is much deeper than women's running. Well, ooh, maybe you shouldn't have said much, but John, that was a good point about Hassan. There's a couple differences. I, I, she's better at the half. I would say she'd been done better at the half marathon than he has relatively before the debuts. I do think the super shoes, Make it easier for someone to move up to the marathon and have success, being probably slightly prepared, less prepared than say, you know, fifteen years ago. And this sort of get well, turgot, I, the K weight. I think back in the day, you needed to have a certain stride. Like when I was running my marathons in those really thin, damn flats, I, I don't think I had. I don't think I was a beautiful runner. I didn't go uh, float on on a pavement. I pounded that pavement, and the tired I got, I just started slamming my legs harder and harder down at mile twenty. And I remember thinking. If I ever run another marathon, this is going to hurt my Achilles. Uh, I'm not going to wear this super thin shoe. My, 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 my legs are destroyed. So people were like either had a nice foot strike and were perfectly suited for the marathon or they really struggled with the distance normally, or they needed a ton of mileage to prepare themselves for that type of pounding. And, and now it's like, you've got shoes that are lighter. Hell, the new alpha fly comes out. What? February 1st, January 1st. It's 15% lighter than, than, than last year, last year's version. Like the shoes are significantly lighter than what I was wearing, but you're getting like, like Hoka type cushioning, like, like gigantic. Like, you've got like three inches underneath. Okay. I'm exaggerating 40 millimeters. How many inches is that underneath your leg? So it's almost like running a marathon on grass, but you get the, the, the bounce of, of, of the pavement, obviously, by yeah. the way, if you want to know the best shoe to run, run in. You need to go to betterrunningshoes.com. Our shoe review site is the best in the business. You know, what? You know, it's kind of like Yelp for shoe reviews, but better. Go there today. See what is the best for you. And we're adding some new features. We've got new new vendors in there. Before we have not been focused on you know helping you buy the shoes. We got Nike in there, Brooks, Zappos. So you can find a great price on a shoe as well. Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day for some reason about the marathon debuts. I, I started, I believed lighter was better. I ran a, a couple marathons in New Balance 150s. And they were like the tiny little thin, the shin, thinnest shoe possible. And I remember thinking, this might be too much pounding on my legs. Maybe I should uh, sacrifice a little weight. But I, I was running one, two marathons a year. I Like once I was at my peak, I didn't really have many chances. And then I was injured. So I just would have loved to have one chance in a super shoe. The, the so. one other thing I want to say about Chip, the guy in this race is we are saying like, Oh, maybe he's not as suited for the marathon as Kip Limo. His half marathon results haven't been as great. He has only run two half marathons and the first one, the world half in 2020, that was 10 days after he set his 10 K world record in Valencia. So I don't know, maybe he wasn't totally recovered or what, and then the other one was in New York. It was cold, and you know he, he got smoked by Kiblimo, but yeah, you know, it wasn't a fast course. So I, I just I'm looking at the Valencia half marathon results. The race Kip Kibwat Tandier won in October of this year, and second Yomi of Kajelcha, fifty seven forty one. Third Hago Skebrewet, fifty seven forty one. Fourth Salomon Borrega, fifty seven fifty. I mean, Chepta guy is. Just as good as those guys on the track, better at 10K, in fact. He beat Borrega for gold in Budapest. It just doesn't make sense to me that a guy who is the world record holder in the 10,000, who is as com competitive with all those guys on the track, wouldn't be able to run a half marathon in the high 57s. I feel like you give him enough shots, he probably can do it. So I'm not saying that changes how I think Chip the guy is going to do on Sunday. I still think it'll probably be around 203, but... 
I have to think this guy can run a 57 minute half marathon if he was healthy and in this Valencia race in October. You were probably being a little harsh on him the more I think about it, John. I mean, he's lost to the greatest half marathoner in the world twice by about 30 seconds. You could do that and still run 57 minutes, I think. I mean, like, that's how good Kip Limo is. So it is Joshua Chapter guy making his marathon debut. And maybe it is crazy. We're singing the praises of Kibu at Kindaway. I think I would probably pick Candy A in a half marathon, but who knows? Maybe the marathon is still a different beast. Maybe, you know, whatever, that marathon pace. Could you be pretty good at 10K and maybe better at the marathon than a half marathon specialist? I'm not ruling that out. So I I, right. I, I hope they're both well, well, up there just battling it out. We have an epic race on Sunday. What I like for both of them is this is a flat, fast course. I mean, Candy has shown no no proclivity to the marathon and his two other – I think he had a 219 at home. I don't know if that's legit. That's like a random race, though. I, didn't, I just kind of just hopped that in. one. But even the yeah. 230, like, it doesn't seem like New York would be his course. Like. This is a rabbited course. It's like a track. These are rhythm runners. Just just get on the train. Nothing's going to happen for 30K. And then see what you got left. So uh, that part is exciting. There's another name in here that we haven't even mentioned. And mark it down. December 1st, 2023. Maybe the last time I mention it. But it still gets me excited. Because it kind of brings me back to my youth when I was in my 20s. Kenny Sipikaley's in this race. He ran 201.41. It wasn't that long ago. When was that? 2018? 2019. 2019, even, even sooner. John, I asked you to reach out to someone in his camp to get any update. Like, am I crazy to be bringing up him as a potential? I don't know. Like, you, you spoke to who? His agent, right? I mean, they're still talking about him. The guy's what, 40? 41. He's 41 years of age. You know, the greatest distance runner in history. Hasn't done much of anything recently. It was a DNF in London earlier this year. But they like, just switched from Nike to some Chinese company. So who knows what their shoes are like. But I don't know. Like his agent was talking to you about making the Olympics. I was like, what? Well, that's what that's what Bekele wants. Obviously, I think Just Hermans is pretty realistic. That's going to be a challenge. But they didn't he even put to... him on the 2016 or 20 and 20 Olympic teams. We're going to put him on 12 years removed. If that happens, the pages need to go black. It needs to be the greatest accomplishment ever. We need to be all in on it. But I'm not expecting much. And if this guy runs a 210, I, we, need, we need to have a rule for a, for a calendar year, 365 days. We do not mention his name again. Because well, I'm still sort of mentioning him like, can we have the magic? Could we have the magic of, of 2019 just pop out again today on Sunday in Valencia? You're the one driving this narrative, Robert. I know, Frankly, but I, can't I help was myself. shocked when I got this text. You need to reach out to to Bekele's people. I'm like, we're still doing that. This guy isn't really relevant anymore. He DNF'd London in April. Last year in lost fall in London, he ran 205.53, which was the Masters World Record since surpassed. I mean that that's all 205.53 for a 40 year old, pretty good, but for being one of the best in the world, you're still a long, long way off. This is a guy who has had some motivation issues, some injury issues through his marathon career. I thought we were kind of done talking about him. It's like, oh, Bekele is on the start list. And then if something happens, you know, then we kind of will reach out to get the backstory. But I don't expect much from him in these races. It's good for him for still getting paid. He's now with Anta. Like, it's hard to get shoe contracts in your 40s, but when you're the goat, I guess it, it does happen. But, and also I do have a question, like Anta does have like a super shoe. They claim to have a super shoe, but does it work? I don't know. So yeah, I mean, do I expect him to, I don't even expect him to be with the leaders, frankly. I think they're going through in 61, 61 flat pace. So targeting like 202, that's the kind of performance you'd need to run to be on the Olympic team. But I don't think it's realistic for him at this point in his career. So I don't have great expectations. We have a new rule, John. I was just checking the first page of the message boards. I'm pretty sure I don't see a Bekele thread. So if the diehards aren't even hyping him up, uh, kudos to Robert for mentioning him, I guess. But yeah, I think the days of mentioning him as a serious contender. I hope to God he proves me wrong, but 
Kinesi Bekele is closer in age to me by a long shot than he is to Joshua Cheptegei if you go off their stated ages. And I, he, I think he he's older than Robert, right? Robert, you only turned 40 this year. So uh, yes. Bekele is actually now somehow traveled through time and is older than you are. I've always been Weldon's baby brother. Well, hey, Josh Herman said 205, 206 would not have been a problem for him in London. He just got disillusioned because he was in like 11th place. He could have kept going and finished fifth or sixth easily. So, all right, that's the men's race. Let's talk women. We had a big drug bust. I, 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 I'm I, sure you know them, John. It seems like Ethiopians never get popped for drugs. But one did get popped. Tell everyone the details. Yeah, it's Se, Se, well, Sehe or Sege Gemachu. Uh, she was the runner-up in Tokyo this year, 216 personal best. She was the top seed for this race, uh, Valencia on Sunday. And then the week of the race, it comes out, she's been suspended for athlete biological passport violations. And I guess we, you kind of have to hold your breath on that after the Nora Gerudo situation. You know, if she has a lawyer and fights this thing, who knows if it gets overturned or whatever. But yeah, she's provisionally suspended for ABP violations. And when I saw this, I, when I, I I wasn't I, frankly I'm not that shocked when I see someone fast get popped these days. It was more like, where have the other Ethiopian busts been? Because this is a point you always bring up, Robert. Kenya, we're getting a new athlete banned every day. Like there was a Kenyan who was banned as part of this announcement. Another Kenyan this morning gets banned. It's just many. You know, it's every week we get one banned. Ethiopia, not so much. Even though they've got a much bigger population and a similar number of elite distance runners the doping cases are much more prevalent in kenya so i wonder if it's the tip of the iceberg or what specifically about her abp was suspicious but yeah i can't say i was stunned when i saw this i have an update before we discuss this woman's race i found the bikini thread Chunking looking Bekele announces participation in Valencia Mar Spanish Marathon, they called it. So that was the that's the most recent thread with Bekele's name in there. I mean, that's like talking about David Radisha. People talk about how chunky he is. So Kenny B, prove us wrong, prove us wrong. But in, in terms of the overall women's field, I mean it's Look, not you guys were on the premise that Ethiopians didn't didn't dope. I mean, that's sort of crazy. No, I've always thought they should do, but I, I just think that they need to catch more of them. And the AIU has told me that they've got a better feel for what's going on in Kenya. There's also a doping lab in Kenya, so it's easier to test them. But someone's posted some stats in the forum about how many tests per athlete there are, and it's, it seems like it's similar in Ethiopia to Kenya. So more to come on that. But anyways, the women's field is not as amazing or not as deep as the men's field. But, you know, you, you've got um, – Two sub two eighteen women, four sub two nineteen, and five sub two twenty. So it, it's certainly quality, led by for me and Alma Zayana. I mean, the twenty sixteen Olympic uh, ten thousand meter champion won the double in twenty, well, won the five thousand in, in twenty fifteen, the ten thousand also in twenty seventeen. But you know, she was only seventh in London this year, but. I don't know. I mean, she had a, a she was out for what, like almost four years with injury. Comes back and, and debuted wonderfully in Amsterdam last year, two seventeen twenty. Takes a step back a little bit in London. So I'm very curious to see what she does here because she wins this race and runs, you know, two fifteen or faster. You know, then then she's one of the big players in the marathon, right? Yeah, and I could see a winning time like that. It sounds like they're going to be going close to the course record which is 214 see the 214 53 or 58 set last year uh by amane bariso and you've got ayana you've got joan chalimo who's run 218.04 gonzebe de baba who's run 218.05 she's running that she ran chicago eight weeks ago ran 221 i guess she's unhappy with that and wants to go faster i feel like you have enough women with PBs in the two teens or low two twenties that are just going to take a shot at it. That one of them might pop off and run it. Ayana is probably the best bet to do it. But what's interesting to me is another woman who I, I hadn't heard this name for a while. Wagnesh Degeffa, 
she's on the entry list. So I'm like, that sounds familiar. Like she used to be really good. What happened to her? Because if you look at her results, she wins Dubai in 2017, 222, then fourth the next year in 219. The next year, she's second in 217, 41 behind Ruth Chepengedic. That is one of the fastest times ever at that point. She does have super shoes, but we hadn't seen the explosion of 216s, 215s, 214s that we have in the last couple of years yet. So I was like, okay, this woman's the real deal. She wins Boston that year. She comes back the next year, wins Dubai. So she's one of the best marathoners in the world right before COVID hits. And she doesn't have any results on her athletics profiles from January 2023, 20, sorry, January 2020 until October 2023, when she returns with a 67-48 win at the Trento Half Marathon. So I reached out to the race director, Juan Manuel Vitella, Valencia, like, what's up with this woman? He said she gave she had a kid. Turns out she's actually had two kids in the interim. So we really have no idea. I mean, 67-48, you got to be – she seems like she's in decent shape. You might have to pull that for the whole marathon to win on Sunday. But she's someone I've got my eye on. She is 33 years old, but she was really, really good before she had her kids. All right, should we make Valencia predictions? I'm looking at the let's run poll here in our preview oh, article. Well, how fast will Joshua Chepka run should. in Valencia? I'm stunned that most people are saying 204 to 205. I guess the options were too flat to 201, 8%, 202 to 203, 41%, 204 to 205, 45%. I was going to say 203 something for him. All right. I've got my predictions ready for both races. Want to hear them? Here we go. Women's race, Amaziana wins it in 214.59. Men's race, Candier. What's the course record in this course, John? 201.53. Kelvin kept them debut last year. Oh, well, he ain't no kept him. 202.57. The weather's going to be magnificent. The race is what, at 8 a.m. there? 8.15, something like that? 15, yep. It's going to be 44, 45 degrees, clear, sunny. Basically, it's going to be between 45 and 50 degrees, minimal wind, six to seven miles per hour. Beautiful day to run fast. So I, I think they're going to get after it. And I'm predicting a 203.23 or uh, sixth place showing for Chip to go. I'll take Gabriel Guillet. <laughs> Of t- Tanzania for the win. What, what's so funny, Robert? Well, is 203.23 really going to be sixth? Does that ever finish sixth in a race? That might be a little bit this, harsh. This, hey, this is Valencia. This is the perfect weather. This is fast field. I mean, if anywhere it's going to happen, that's the place these days. I'm taking Guillet for the win. I like how he ran here last year. I liked how he ran in Boston. 202.15, something like that. I don't think they're going to get under 201. And yeah, 203. So, I mean, that's about the exact same ballpark. Uh, maybe I'll price this right, Robert, here, and I'll say he runs 203. 29. Uh, fourth place for Chep the guy. I'll say that. Um, women's side, I'll take Ayana 216. Well, guys, I just. just discovered a name here the Budweiser long shot Daniel Dos Nascimento Ooh. and this is the crazy like MFR man who ran New York got so far ahead went in the porta potty took a break still was leading New York exited the porta potty still went down the street still leading lays down on the road while leading the New York City Marathon before getting passed but if he runs crazy and really pushes the pace, man, like, oh, I would love to see something like that early on. Because I want, I mean, just, it is so deep, as we've noted. Like, I mean, I'm like way down here on the list. Wow, just like crazy names, you know? Um, Siste Lima, we haven't mentioned. Don Asimento, fastest oh, non-African born marathoner in history where where do you think he ranks on the all-time list out of interest his pb is 204 51 
the fastest ever born outside of Africa. Where do you think that r- ranks him overall? 56th. Robert? What is the time, John? 204.51. 82nd. Oh, close. Tied for 76th. So the top 75 are all born in Africa. I mean, that's nuts. Oh, by the way, we, we should have, speaking of top 75, uh, we probably should have led with this. I'm really excited. The shoe execs that are watching, please send your offers to the Let's Run Business address so you can find it online. I'm pretty sure Will and I are going to be signing a shoe deal soon because did you guys say, see this? Nico and Lex Young, or not Nico, Leo and Lex Young, they're twins like Weldon and I. They're kind of prominent figures in the running world, even though neither one of them is a running star. The highest that they finished was 70, one of them finished 74th at the NCAA Cross Country Championships. And they've just signed a shoe deal with On. So if they can get a shoe deal, well, I mean, Weldon was once fourth in the country. We're, we're twins. Weldon and I have a prominent social media following of our website, not necessarily of us personally, because we don't do our own Instagram pages. But I mean, John, is it just a matter of time before we get offers here, do you think? Or how is that going to work? Well, you can't sign an LA NIL deal after using your NCAA eligibility. I'm pretty sure I know Weldon used his. And do you, I don't think you keep eligibility. I know you didn't use any of yours, Robert, when you were in college, but I don't think you can maintain it after actually being in college. So, I mean, look, they're both top high school prospects. Okay, they didn't light the world on fire this fall in cross country, but they are really popular. They have 47,000 subscribers to their YouTube channel. So that plus clearly they are talented runners, you know, with what they were doing last year and on the track, breaking records or running very close to all-time records in the high school level. Leo was leading the US team to the bronze medal at World Cross. I, I don't think it's this why would this shock you? I guess the shocking thing is that Nico Young still doesn't have an NAL deal with a shoe brand. You, you would kind of think he would, given that he's also quite popular and he's finished top 10 at NCAA cross, you know, three times. It doesn't shock me. I'm excited. I mean, a, a top shoe executive texted me. You surely know that being a slow runner is fine. If you have massive influence on a target audience, I'm a slow runner. And you think I'd have a massive influence, particularly on like on's target audience. I mean, every like, 35, 45 year old rich housewife in, in the B- Baltimore County seems to be wearing on these days. And we know that that girl, Lisa, who watches these shows is obsessed with me. So maybe I should just start a high school site. Like if I just start talking about high school, I actually, on a serious business, and I've noticed this, like you see new balance signing these high school stars. It makes more sense because you can sign these people for nothing, particularly on the men's side. You give them a few thousand dollars and these high schoolers pay more attention to, the top high school athlete than they do. Certainly Kenesi Bekele or Joshua Chepta guy. They don't even know who those are. Like I remember one time when I was coaching in college, Spurs club members upset when, when I dropped the name of an Ivy league school, but I don't know how to say the name of the school without, I don't, I guess I don't have to say it's Ivy league. When I was coaching at Cornell, I had the freshmen there. There's like 10 of them. I said, how many of you know who, who Howard Gabasillas is? And only like half of them knew who he was. So they probably knew though, who, you know, Nico, Leo and, and Lex Young were. Because... Well, then how many times have you heard that story? I think I'm into double digits now, but it's you've fine, John. Robert much longer, Not everybody so... listens to every, every aspect of the show, but I was actually talking to, I think it was a guy that wanted me to coach him maybe, or it was a problem. I was going, I said, well, what have you been doing? And they said, I've just been watching Leo and Lex Young's YouTube videos all summer. So there you have it. Congrats to them. No, I, I I just thought, like, this is good. The twins, it, it's a thing that the shoe companies want good-looking twins who are still... All right, can we stop the Leo and, and Lex okay. joke? Like, like, this went too far. All right. Kibu Akande, 20202 for your win. Um, Ayana, 216.02. O2 is, is the key. All right. John wait, wait. will be there tomorrow night. We have the BU 5,000 meters. Well, then, last point I want to make on Valencia. American marathoners, men's marathoners, should be watching the results of this race because there is a ton of people in this field with PRs like 211, 210, 209 from all different countries. I haven't run the all the numbers on this yet to see like how many might actually displace them. 
but there are 46 guys in this race who've run t- under 211. And the US, I would not say is they don't comfortably have that final spot in the world rankings. Like you need to be top 64 uh, as of January 30th on the road to Pal- Paris. Right now, Scott Farble's 61st. Could someone or a couple of people from countries who don't already have three bump him down a few spots and leave the US in jeopardy? If it's going to happen, it's probably going to happen at this race. I haven't looked exactly who could do it, but I think once we see the results on Sunday, we need to take an eye on who's run under 208.10, which is the Olympic standard, or who has improved their ranking enough that they might be able to surpass uh, Fable. I think you really only need to worry about that 208.10, and it's, you know, they got to be from countries that don't, aren't already up there. So I didn't, I don't have the list of who's already up there, but right now I think I'm going to be rooting against Joaquin Arbe of Argentina, 209.36, Juan Pacheco of Mexico, 209.45. Do not run under 208.10, please. Ooh, what about Peter Herzog of Austria? Is it Austria, 210.06? I mean, a two-minute PB, there's a lot, but this is going to be perfect weather, and you know they're just going to peg that pace right at 208.10, right? Kevin Seward of Ireland, 210.09. Does Italy have two, John? Yassin El Fatwa, 210.00. We shall see. Yeah. We'll sh- shake the dust off and figure it all out when the new batch of rankings come out on Tuesday. All right. Well, then, BU meet. We did talk about this a little bit on the regular pod about, you know, Parker Valley of Florida is going to be that. 19 of the top 20 men at NCAA Cross are going to be in, the, in this meet. 16 of them in the 5K. For some reason, Nico Young and Drew Bosley of NAU are doing the 3K. Any thoughts on this? Anything you're really excited? Anything you wanted to cover that we didn't already discuss on Tuesday's show? I'm just mainly excited about Parker Valby being the first woman to go sub 15 from the NCAs. It's going to be a great day. That's all well, I need to say in about the spring it. when she does it outdoors. It's not happening on for tomorrow. I disagree with John. It's going to happen. Why wouldn't it happen? It's going to happen. I agree with Weldon. Okay, I'll tell you why. The race is being paced for 15-12. Parker Valby did an interview last week or this week with Chris Chavez. She said, I'm not going for a fast time. I'm just going to qualify for the NCAAs. So that's why she's not running under 15. Weak sauce, weak sauce, Parker. You don't need a rabbit. Why not do it? Her coach doesn't want her to do it because he doesn't want her to go pro. He didn't want her to go out and run a 14-45 in this race and then have the shoe execs just dump the money at, at, you know, so man, that's disappointing. God. So then let's don't even talk about this abysmal race that I was kind of joking, like thinking about this. I'm like, okay, we get so excited for BU every year. Then I'm like, why? Like we haven't even mentioned the word, the cross champs, which were on Thursday in Austin, Texas. But the winner of that was Adrian Wilchcott of South Africa via Florida state. Who's now part of the Hoka NAZ elite. But We've never gotten he's a 1302 guy. Uh, it's unlikely that the, the time is even that fast in this race. Do we get excited when Adrian Wilscott, who was when we last saw him racing at the NCAA level, was 16th at the 2022 NCAA Outdoor 5000, rolls into a 5000? No, we don't. But for some reason, we get really excited about this race, and I am excited about it, but not the women's race anymore. If, if, if Balby's not going for it, it has no interest. They're going to get their qualifiers and take the break. So that's the women's story. I guess I'll be interested to see who will show John, if it's paced at 15, 12, somebody could go 15. That's not out of the realm of possibility. So what's the NCAA time? You think she's just going to go run a 15, 30 and call it a day? No. No, I think she'll run up front with the, with the last two years. This race has been won in 1508 by Annie Rodenfels of BAA. I imagine it'll be right around this and Rodenfels probably has a better kick than park of Alby. So yeah, I look, she, she's, she, she's in shape to run sub 15 right now. If she, if she wanted to, I think she would have a very good shot at getting that maybe well under 15, maybe the Olympic center 1452, but to do that, you need to have someone break off in the middle of the race. I don't think it's going to be Rodenfels. I don't think it's going to be anyone else. And Park of Albi doesn't sound like someone who wants to do it either. That's why I don't think we're going to see sub-15. You just need somebody to kick the last K and they'll get it. It's an 
if you if she's that good, she mm-hmm. could kick the last K and still get it. I'm not ruling it out. That's all I'm gonna say. What about Doris Lim goal? She's not in here, right, John? The 1440 Rhodes girl, the NCAA runner up cross country. Correct. She's not running. I mean, I, I did famously earlier in January, I saw the pacing times for the BU 5K, and Sam Parsons said, Oh, American record could be in danger. Sorry, the BU 3K. I was like, there's no way in hell Yard Nagus shows up and runs the American record in his first race of the season when it's not even being paced that fast. But then they changed the rabbits right before the race. So this look, if this race is being paced 15-12, no one's running sub-15. It's just not happening. You need you someone mean, uh, to take it. I don't think anyone will. I disagree with well, I disagree with John that if it's 15-12, you can kick and get under 15 on that. But if it's 15-12, like that suggests there's no one in the field who wants to try to run sub-15. Why? What's the point of trying to run 15-12? What, what does that number mean? I guess 15-12, according to su- some people call it the NCAA record because Emily Sisson ran that. What do you, where do you guys stand on this? Jay Simpson ran 1501 at Washington in 2009 on the 300 meter track. Should that be the NCAA record? Or should it be 1512 by Sisson? Well, I mean, that's the problem with our sport, but I'm going with the 1501. That's the fastest time. The record can be 1512, but we want to see a sub 15. I don't care if somebody runs 1508. All right, men's side. I mean, I, I don't. I'm disappointed that the rabbiting here is only what thirteen ten. Yeah, but this is different. It's well, to me, it's different because the Olympic stands for thirteen oh five. I do think it is possible if they're pacing it for thirteen ten. So you know, blank Graham Blanks on our podcast this week said he'd like to run the Olympic stand. He thinks there are guys who can do it in this field. So that to me, if someone. That just needs someone to really pick it, keep it going uh, during that fourth kilometer, third or fourth kilometer. And if they can keep doing that, then I do think someone, the winner, might be able to kick their way to a 13.03 or 13.04 or maybe even faster. 13.12 is what the race is being paced for. So I guess maybe I'm being hypocritical because I'm saying, oh, there's no way they can run under 13 minutes i'm there's i'm no i'm saying there's no way parker valby can run into 15 minutes but the sub 13 or sub 1305 might be possible for the men but it's also because the best woman in the women's race has said she's not targeting the fastest possible time that's my coloring my thinking on this people always just play down expectations All right, Kai Robinson is my pick for the win. I think it's John's as well. He won last year. John made a good point. He was 10th at NCAA Cross, ran 13-11 this year. This year he's higher up at NCAA Cross. I think he wins this 13-07. Yeah, he's, got, he's strong. Maybe not quite as strong as Blanks, but is Blanks strong enough to drop him in a track race at the moment? I'm not totally sure that. Kai Robinson's got the best mm. kick. I think he'll still be in there, so I think he'll win it as well. But I am. I mean, as far as time trials go, I'm fairly excited to see this one. Even though we did see pretty much all these guys race each other two weeks ago in Charlottesville. Surprised Jerry doesn't have those guys in this one. There's only one race. By the, the Bowerman guys seem to show up for. I mean, how many Bowerman guys are even ready to run this race right now? Well, then. We, Charles Hicks just ran cross champs on Thursday. Is Evan Jager healthy at this point? Justin Knight's not ready to race. And then how many other bodies do they have? I guess Mohamed is around. They, they these The pros usually will run the, the BU meets in January or February. They're not usually at this one. Yeah, I don't understand why. Well, yeah, I mean, Charles Hicks made his Bowerman Track Club debut on Thursday of this week. People say they never race. He did race. and It wasn't his debut. I, he ran for them over the summer, FYI. And I was pleased that, you know, that we had a, a professional cross country race in America for the second year in a row, World Athletics Gold. And, you know, I was on the message board thread up at 8:30 a.m. on on Thursday watching this, and people were like, "This field's terrible." Blah blah. And I was like, "These guys probably would have won the NCAA cross country championship. It would be fascinating to run rerun the race and put the top four or five in it." I mean, the winner of last year's race, admittedly, we don't know if he's in the same type of shape, but 
<laughs> Charles Hicks was fourth, 22-15. But Adrian Wilchcott, who's run 13-02, won one in 22-07. A great day for the Hokie NAZ Elite as they went one, three, five, nine on the men's side. And Katie Wasserman won the girls for them when they go one, three, four, nine on the, on the women's side. So, you know, I, I, I thought that it, sh- it shows you kind of how it's hard to market professional track and field because there were some really good runners in the men's race, but it doesn't have the buzz. It doesn't have the excitement. It doesn't have the meaning of an NCAA cross country race. It's not even close to me. Yeah, of course so. not. But I kudos. Hey, kudos to Jesse Williams and Sound Running for actually getting a World Athletics Cross Country Tour event in the United States. It's an opportunity for people, Americans, to improve their World Cross Country ranking, which is an avenue to qualify for the Olympics. Seems like most of the Americans didn't weren't interested in doing that, so it's not. I think it's an opportunity missed. But the one thing I would say, I do think this event. Last year they changed they've changed the course from last year. I still feel like they need to find this a perfect cross country venue because the reason they changed from last year, a number of athletes were complaining, oh, it's unsafe, it's you know, the turns are too tight, or some of the turns are uneven, that sort of thing. That's why one of the reasons on Athletics Club showed up last year. And I think they're basically like, Well, we're not showing up to this event again. We don't want to get anyone injured, even though Yard and Goose ran really well and then had the best season of his life. But this year's course was kind of the opposite. It was just, there was no hills or anything. It was just flat loops around a grass field. There was some airplanes in the background, which was kind of cool. It was on a military base, but you, you know, any European who watched this race would have been laughing at it. They're like, this isn't a cross country course at all. You still need to have that mix of challenge with, whereas also balancing, you don't want to have, I don't know, athletes complaining or worrying that they might get injured on it and maybe that balance is really hard to strike so i don't know but i still feel like they need to find the perfect venue for this spot all right speaking of on athletics our coach jathan ritzenheim has been a popular man on the message board because some are speculating this could be mark wetmore the colorado coaches last year at Colorado, his con- we know that his contract is up, so he'd have to get renewed. He's 70. Will they renew him? There's been some controversy. The team wasn't very good this year. And someone's like, would Ritzenheim take over? I, I think that the message board threat on this is quite bad. Like a-, a lot of people were saying, there's so much more travel as a pro coach than college coach. To me, it's the opposite. When I got out of coaching, I, I- people said, do you, want- you know, do you miss it? Blah, blah, blah. I said, I miss the kids. I don't miss the lifestyle. And I thought the easiest lifestyle to balance a family would be to be a pro coach. When you're a pro coach, you don't have to show up every day to watch them run their easy runs. You don't have to go to every meet, you know, from a liability standpoint, you don't have to hold their hands. You can tell them to get on the plane. You watch it on TV. Now Ritzenheim does travel more than most, a lot of college coaches and, and you're constantly recruiting. You got to get on the plane, go to the home visits, etc. So I used to joke, do you want to make 35 to 40 week thousand a year to make, to make and work 30 to five to 40 weekends a year. Now Ritzenheim does travel to Europe with the team. He, he's all in. He likes to be right with the team, but we, we've seen that, that that wasn't the case with Chris Fox or Rebecca Boston or Jerry Schumacher or, or Pete Julian. They don't even live in the same towns as their team. Now I, I think as a recruiting standpoint, I think the fact that Ritz is all in and he travels with them would sell me on the team and make me more likely to pick on than another shoe brand if the money's similar. But to me, I don't think that he would take the Colorado job. One, I have an idea of how much money he's making and on. Someone told me he's just a little bit shy of $500,000. I haven't had that confirmed, but so he makes more than I assume what Mark, Mark Wetmore makes. Only a couple of college coaches make that. And he's already, he's coaching like a 343 miler and he doesn't have to recruit like on recruits for him. They just pick a few people a year and you're picking the best of the world. You're not, you're, you're not trying to get people to come to Colorado over NAU. And then I don't know. I, the team stuff's fun. I imagine it's more fun to be a college coach with the team aspect, but I think it's a lot more work. And, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that he would do both. So I just think that he's got a great gig going. I don't see this happening. What about you guys? Yeah. I'd be stunned if he took it for the exact, well, first, if he was offered it, if you Colorado went that direction, for all the reasons you laid out, the one benefit I can see to this is really his pro athletes in Boulder would now have 
free access, free reign over the Colorado athletics facilities. That's really the only like but, benefit but we, I can see. Everything else is just like he already. What are these pro athletes? Oh, Sorry, I might the, fire him. The, the OAC athlete athletes would have. Access. Oh, you're saying he would do both? Oh yeah, I, I that's what I was assuming. Like, the, why did Jerry Schumacher? Why did all these people leave Bauman? I mean, one of the things is the move to Eugene didn't go well. Well, this one there would be no move in, move involved, but. I don't see like if you're saying you can either be the head coach of OAC or the head coach of Colorado, I think I take OAC. You get to coach Yared Nagus. You get to coach some of the best people in the world. The travel, he, Ritz does travel a lot. There is still, a lot. it's not like he's, this isn't a time intensive dog, job. He takes it very seriously. But I feel like if he starts, if he tries to bring that to Colorado as well, it's going to be hard for him to balance both of those jobs. And to me, what lifestyle wise, I feel like I would much rather take OAC. So I, I don't, I see v like close to zero chance of Ritz at Colorado to replace Wetmore. Yeah. This right I don't, now, there's no way I see him doing both. It could be very difficult with seeing that with Jerry. I, mean, I think you can do both. Well, Mike if you Smith were doing does both. College before, I mean, no, it's a separate, completely separate thing. Robert, he coaches a few athletes on the side. He already has a pro group. Now he's going to try to implement a college group from scratch. Those are different things going that direction. We discussed this multiple times. I, I wish the salary stuff you're just crazy, you're throwing out there. You're thinking he makes like a, a couple times more than what Mark Wetmore makes. I don't see that. Ritz was like an assistant college coach before this. I don't see him making that kind of money now unless there was huge bonus incentives. But um, okay. assuming the money's sort of equal, there is probably more job security. Well, I don't know. I mean, the, On's just getting us started. It seems like a great gig. They're on the upswing. I don't see why you leave that job. Well, he might not have a choice. If I was on, I might fire him. Why? I, re I read something on the message board this week. I mean, just now, right before we started the show. Someone says, on shoes are crap. Dathan's daughter, Adley, normally races in Nikes. I was like, wow. I, I'll, right before we show the show, I, I posted the message board. Wow, is this true? If I was, I was on, I would be irate. I don't know. I haven't paid attention. Well, to I wouldn't say their shoes are crap. Shoe choices. I wouldn't say their shoes are crap. Their performances are so well on the track and on spikes. I'm, I've, I've even wondered... Could their spikes be better than Nike's or something? I mean, like, that's the direction I've gone because it's always hard to play this game, right? Because Nike has the most resources, the most athletes, and then people sort of, they associate how fast they're running with the, with the quality of the shoes. And don't get me wrong, Nike shoes are amazing. But with On, there wasn't the assumption, they, don't, they weren't starting off with the best athletes, and now they have some of the best in the world. So you're like, wow, could it be the shoes or the coach? Or whatever. So I, I think the the big picture thing is when this group started, what now three years ago, no one envisioned this success. They're banging it out of the wall park. The, you know, Ritz would probably need to get paid like a half million dollars a year or something to to leave on and have it guaranteed. He'd have to get paid a lot of money, but Colorado to take that job, I, I see it. So, well, the other thing is though. Um, OAC does have stuff left to accomplish. Like Helen O'Beary's won two world marathon majors this year. She's been amazing. And obviously they've had a lot of amazing performances, but let's not forget how many world or Olympic medals outdoors has this team won? Zero. So still got some work to do, but he, they're doing a great job. I didn't think they'd be this successful three years in well then. And I think he'd be foolish to leave this job uh, after how he's built the program up. Yeah, I mean, we don't. We have no idea what the money's making. I mean, Robert's figures just, just seemed off to me. But like, people are talking about a college f power five guy making two fifty k a year. Um, if anything, you could use this for negotiating. Dave Smith makes like six or seven hundred thousand a year. Some of these guys make eight hundred. So I don't think him making four something isn't crazy. By the way, Jordan Dunley of Avon must be watching live. He just says hi, Rojo. Circus just called. Seems like you've escaped again. I'm That's sorry, good. I'm so smart. It's <laughs> a great comment. Look, I actually thought about this. My dad worked for Pepsi. We didn't have to drink Pepsi at home, but I would be annoyed. I think the shoes are great because they have. I mean, I, I, the other day when I was showering, I was like, "Wait a minute, what did the goose run in the mile?" I'm like, 
I was thinking it was 345. I'm like, 343? That's crazy. But maybe they don't have a because cross country. How many people run cross country? Maybe they don't have a great cross country spike. And maybe they're doing the right thing and letting her wear a better cross country spike when she races in her high school cross country races. So I would be for that because remember, we ripped the shoe companies that didn't have the super shoes. Some of them still don't. And they won't let them wear them, wear them in, the, in the marathon races. So that would be the right thing. But when I saw that right before the show, I was like, wow, man. You know, they're paying daddy a lot of money. You know, try to wear the shoe if you can. Yeah, I don't I don't think he's going to be fired for that. But all right. One other thing before we sign off. This has been a supersized Friday 15 for you guys. It is a big weekend of running. World Marathon Majors, they came out with a statement. I kind of forgot about this. Like they've been undergoing these review processes with these candidate races for a number of years. And they said the city, they've basically, they dispatch these people to see if the candidate races meet certain criteria. And I don't exactly know what that criteria is, but apparently Sydney has met it for the 2023 edition. They said they, they did. I don't think they met it in 2022. If they meet the criteria again in 2024, they will be granted admission to the World Marathon Majors starting in 2025. And it was kind of noteworthy because they also said they were studying the Chengdu Marathon and the Cape Town Marathon this year, which were the other two candidate races. Neither of them met this criteria. So it does seem like Sydney is getting pretty close. If they do it again, they're going to be in the World Marathon Majors starting in 2025, and I can already see a Rojo rant incoming. did my music work did y'all hear that not really wow the cape town marathon didn't meet their standards no don't want to say it on air don't want to get censored of course it didn't they don't have enough money to me to be a world marathon major you need to have an elite marathon you need to have a super elite field and a lot of people in the race like, but Weldon said it best. Why are they diluting their product? What are we going to have? 40 majors? Then it's just going to be like the Diamond League circuit. So which majors do we pair? Do do we pay attention to it? Let's run. Dubai used to really be up there. And in our mind, it was the same as a major. It's kind of fallen off a little bit, but you know, Valencia has taken its spot. So we'll have the let's run majors. That's what everyone will pay for. We'll, we'll pay attention to. We'll get like a, a we'll get a sponsor and we'll get a, one of those like WWE type championship belts. And, you know, maybe if you're the champion, you get, you get a hundred grand. And then if you lose, if you, if you're beaten, it should be head to head. If you lose, maybe we only have one marathon champion. And then if you lose someone else, they're the champion. It's kind of like boxing. I like the idea of a belt, actually, like a marathon world's greatest marathon, marathon, a belt or something. And you can claim the title. We kind of decide who the title is. And then. You know, we get them we to take a picture to with the belt once they, you know, if they win London, we're like, hey, this is the t- the belt is up for grabs on Sunday. If you beat this guy, you're the new champ. And they take that picture with it and hold it above their heads. And th- I mean, that's kind of awesome. But the best part about boxing is it's pretty obvious as to what happened. Like the guy's knocked down and he's like knocked out on the feet, on the, on the, on the uh, canvas. And you just take the belt from him and hand it to the new guy. Like, would we like, vote like sometimes it's not clear who's the best marathoner in the world like if kipchoge gets hurt a lot and then well i mean now we know it's kept him right but like Kip, kept him never beat kipchoge so kipchoge kipchoge would still have his his belt because he yeah, won berlin we, we got to keep this thing as simple as possible and maybe it'll it doesn't lend as much credence to the belt but i think you just got to have the belt dangling at the finish line like right above the finish line tape and it's like okay hey We've just, I guess they have the Olympics for this thing and they give out the gold medals at the finish, but you, you want to keep Heisman it simple, trophy. you know? Yeah, I agree, but we could do the Heisman Trophy of marathons, the Jonathan Galt Award. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think that's going to do it. We do have a jam-packed weekend of racing. This, I'm shocked we've made it over an hour into the podcast. No one has congratulated me on Brighton and Hove Albion's historic week. Went to Athens beat Ike Athens to advance in the Europa League. Our journey goes on. We will be vying for the Europa League in the knockout rounds in 2024. It's the JV Cup of Europe, but it's better than whatever Crystal Palace is playing in this year. So uh, I just, I feel like that deserves some note. 
in our podcast. We haven't even mentioned, and this is why we all have not been signed to sponsorship deals. By the way, Jordan, go back and watch the beginning of the podcast if you missed it. Um, we haven't mentioned NXN, the High School National Championships. We'll, we'll, we'll keep that, recap that on Tuesday show. Also, the Fukuoka Marathon is this weekend. Kind of interesting to me. Apparently, from according to Brett Larner, Japan Running News on Blogspot, they um, they're setting the whole race up for one guy. So Fukuoka used to be like the unofficial World Championships, but they're trying to get Kyohei Hosoya, who's a 206.35 PB. He's the best guy in the field. I think he's like the only Japanese guy under 210 in the race. And they're setting everything up for him to try to break 205.50. So if he breaks 205.50, the third place at the trials is out. I do think we should do that in the U.S. We have our trials. We name the top three. And then we set this time. And the problem is there's not like a fast spring marathon that people could go to. But it would be fun, right? Yeah, who, yeah, I'm trying well, I'm we trying set the standard that out because if the yeah, if the if the US had the standard at 205.50, like would we even cover it? Let's run like who's gonna go for like, like would somebody go out in 62 30, 63 minutes? Galen Rupp, maybe Galen Rupp doesn't make oh, the Rupp team, he'd, do he'd do it, but then you, you, it would be playing out, and the problem is it would be playing out in London, you know, mm-hmm. or some somewhere like that. No one's you know, no one's gonna try to do that in Boston, uh, so. I don't know, but it, it is kind of entertaining. Also, CIM is on Sunday, the last shot for many Americans to get that Olympic trials qualifier in. So, or more importantly, get that two eleven thirty qualifier if you want to go to. Although well, it wouldn't count, right? Because it's downhill. I don't know if it's on the World Athletics list or not. Honestly, so no, it's it's downhill. Alex Gill, our intern, asked how many people are going to break it. But I don't think it counts. All right, everybody. Thanks to all that have joined the Supporters Club New. We gave you a special long edition. I remember when we started the second podcast, we we can't do 15 minutes. It's much more than that. It's not enough to talk about. I now think we should do a 15-minute podcast every day. But we'll I really see. don't think there's enough to talk about on that. No, we I always end up going time. long. But like next, Politics. what are we going to talk about next week? We've got, foot, I guess, Foot Lockers and Eurocross. We're going to get an hour out of that? I don't think so. Bekele's world record. Touche. Touche. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. See you on the regular pod on Tuesday. Till then.